So the system that we're looking for that will reduce conflicts is a system that is going to specify which individuals may exercise uh, enforceable control over which things. Because if you have a right, it doesn't mean anything if you're not allowed to enforce it. I mean, you can talk all day long about your property rights while the government is, is, is uh, bulldozing your house. So the, the ability to enforce the right is important. So this is what rights theory and interpersonal ethics are, are seeking to address. Now, I think it's also important as a preliminary step to observe that everybody, even thieves, even communists, even fascists, everybody presupposes a theory of rights and ownership. Everybody does. Because the communists are not saying nobody should own anything. They're not saying no one should exercise a range of control over anything. They're saying these people should exercise that range of control, not these exploiters. A thief is saying, I should have control over these goods because I'm big and strong and I've got a gun and I can take them from you, and you shouldn't. So in effect, he also has a theory, it's a, it's a crummy theory, but he, he does believe, he's not saying no one should exercise control over anything. Everybody's got some theory as to who should control property, bureaucrats, governments, thieves, uh, whatever, free individuals, everybody's got some understanding of, of how ownership should be conferred. But what's controversial about Hans Hoppe's argumentation ethics is he's arguing that only the libertarian theory of property can actually be rationally justified. You can have a million theories. This is the only one that can be rationally justified in an argument. Now, how does he come to this very uh, sort of shocking conclusion? And by the way, by libertarian theory, of, of rights and ownership, all he means is the idea, really, that comes from Locke and, uh, you know, perhaps purified by Rothbard, the idea that the owner of something is either the first user of the thing, as in the case of a, of a previously unowned good, or the transferee of that good by means of gift or bequest or sale. That's the libertarian theory of, of rights and property ownership. And he's arguing this is the only one that can be, argu that can be argumentatively justified. Now, according to, to Hoppe, any type of normative proposition you might want to advance has to be advanced in the course of an argument. We don't come into the, this world with normative arguments already emblazoned on our brains. We have to hear them. We have to come to understand them. And then using our reason, rationally come to accept them. So we have to engage in the practical activity. We're not disembodied ghosts. We are real human beings who need to learn things in the course of a, the give and take of discourse and argument. Now, therefore, Hoppe says that given how important argument is to reaching conclusions, particularly to reaching conclusions about how society should be organized and what rights there are and who can do what, well, if there are norms of argumentation that are presupposed by everyone who engages in argument, then it becomes logically impossible to argue against these norms and be consistent. And according to Hoppe, the only uh, property assignment rules that can be consistently advanced in argumentation, such that you are not contradicting yourself, is the libertarian one. So for instance, you can't argue that argument is impossible because you're contradicting yourself, right? You're making an argument that you can't argue. Or you couldn't try to reason that reason doesn't exist. Well, you're using reason, right, in, in the very act of trying to do it. So you're contradicting yourself through your actions. So Hoppe, in effect, is going to say that you cannot, in a non-contradictory way, advance any competing theory of, of ownership titles. So, so let's, let's um, examine this in a little bit more detail here. He says, I think I've covered this, um, the act of argumentation itself takes certain norms for granted. To argue coherently, one cannot deny the very norms that really that are presupposed by the participants as being true. So really what Hoppe is saying is that, you know, I, I Hans Hoppe, I'm a libertarian, but really so are you, you just don't realize it. That every time we engage in argument, we're temporarily all being libertarians. Because what we're engaged in is a peaceful attempt to persuade someone of a proposition. It's not an attempt to persuade them by saying, look, I'm going to argue with you for a little while, but if you don't accept what I'm saying, then I'm going to clock you over the head. Well, that's not argumentation by definition. That's a threat. 
Argumentation is a peaceful, conflict-avoiding way of reaching conclusions. And so when you're engaged in it, you are, in effect, demonstrating your preference for peaceful, conflict-free paths to resolving disputes. And so when you're arguing, you are, in effect, giving voice and giving action to these, basically this very libertarian way of understanding that I am, I am recognizing your right to control your body and listen to me, and I'm not gonna hit you over the head or otherwise I wouldn't be engaged in argument anymore. And, and, and I recognize my ability to exercise control over my body. So we're sort of taking for granted certain norms already as soon as we engage in argument. And we're convincing people through persuasion and with reason and with respect for that person's rational faculties and physical integrity. So uh, what are these norms that are implied in the very act of argumentation? Well, the first such norm, I've already implied a couple, uh, you know, that we, we favor peaceful rather than violent uh, resolutions of our disputes. But the first norm that he, that he talks about is universalizability. And all that means is that if I'm going to propose a rule that I think people in society should follow, this rule has to be universalizable. That is to say, I need to be able to state the rule in such a way that it would apply universally to all people simultaneously. So for example, uh, if I were to say, I can hit you, but you can't hit me, that's not a universalizable rule. Because that's actually saying some subset of people, namely me, gets to hit you, but you don't get to hit me. This is this is not universal because you're not able to exercise the same power that I'm able to exercise. This is what we would call a particularist rule that singles out an individual or a group of individuals. It says, we get to do certain things to the rest of you. Well, that's not a universalizable rule because then that doesn't apply to the rest. So it's not universal, it's, it's particularist. And the reason he argues that, what, what Hans is gonna say here is that argumentation takes for granted the principle that the rules we live by are, uni are universalizable. And it, it takes that for granted because, number one, argumentation is a peaceful, conflict-avoiding activity. It does not involve violence. It involves persuasion only. Therefore, in principle, any argument we offer has to, in principle, be acceptable to all people. Otherwise, there'd be no way we could argue for it rationally. There'd be no way we could rationally expect everybody to accept a particularist norm. I get to hit you, but you don't get to hit me. It's very, very hard to expect people everywhere to accept that in argument. The only way you could get them to accept it is by enslaving them or drugging them or whatever. But in, under the terms of argumentation, which is a peaceful, non-coerced method of interacting, the only way you could expect somebody to accept a norm, a rule of living that's being proposed is that it would have to be universalizable. Or if it is particularist, the reason for the particularism would have to be understood to the reason. So for example, um, authorized personnel only, that's a particularist rule. But there's an objective reason behind it that all of us can recognize. Like, I don't know what would happen if I went behind there because I don't know how to deal with electronics or something and I'd blow myself up. That's a rational, objective reason we can understand there. But unless there is some rational, universally acknowledgeable reason to justify a particularist rule, you can't. They have to be universalizable. Now, so right away, the universalizability, right away it rules out certain norms. Right away it rules out socialism. I, I can take from you, you can't take from me. Socialism doesn't even pass the first norm of, of argumentation. But, but universalizability is necessary but not sufficient because it's also universalizable to say everybody should get drunk on Friday night. Uh, it's, yeah, people are clapping for that, yeah. <laughs> but likewise, it's also universalizable to say uh, everyone should be executed for drinking on a Friday night. So universalizability is not sufficient, but it's a beginning. Now let's skip down to, to, to letter E. When we are engaged in argumentation, we are acknowledging that we value the ability to use things. First of all, I value the ability to use my own body to engage in the argumentation. I value the ability to use the things that keep me alive, that make it possible for me to be standing here making this argument. Right away, we automatically acknowledge that we value the ability to use things. What the norms of argumentation in turn do is that they presuppose a certain way of assigning rights to the use of these things. 